Arit, and I'm an assistant professor at CU Boulder, and I'm really excited to be here. Um, me and my colleagues are at a field station just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, we're in the midst of this beautiful and peaceful meadow, and we're gathered inside a small little shed. We're about to turn the switch on to start a seemingly mundane experiment where we have a motor that is designed to shake a pretty simple wooden board. Um, but we actually give each other one last look of concern because right underneath this board, there is a swarm of 10,000 uh, stingy honeybees that cling on each other uh, in this really beautiful, magnificent pulsing cone. Um, so who in the right minds would shake a honeybee swarm, you might be asking? Uh, did we do this just for fun? Uh, in short, no, uh, but let's take a step back to understand how by studying these honeybee swarms we could uh, deepen our understanding of these really important pollinators at a crucial step of their reproductive cycle, but also suggest how we might be using this uh, knowledge in the um, uh, world of swarm robotics. So uh, the swarms in our study occur as part of the reproductive cycle of European honeybees. At some point during the spring and summer, the colony divides into two groups, and then one group and a queen fly, and they hang like this from, from tree branches. Um, and it, to create that structure, they actually use little vertical-like hairy patches and hooks on their, on their legs. So essentially, they're holding hands to create these really congested, dense stru uh, structures, which is, um, tends to be highly adaptable. It can even form on uh, roofs and benches and cars. Uh, but while they are suspended like this, they actually have no nest to protect themselves from the elements. So they need to adapt in real time to temperature variations, to wind, and to rain. Um, also, the swarm is so big that a bee can potentially uh, coordinate its activity with neighboring bees that are right next to it, but it can certainly not directly coordinate its activity with a bee at the completely other side of the swarm. Um, so how do they manage to maintain mechanical stability, which is a process that sometimes uh, demands this simultaneous coordination throughout the entire structure? Um, so one approach to do this is to just study these swarms unperturbed, but we took a slightly different approach where we decided to perturb the system, sort of um, poke the bear or poke the bees in that case. Um, uh, and then from the response of the, the, the swarm, we can learn something about its underlying principles. So this brings me back to the swarm shaking experiment that I started with. Uh, we were shaking the bees right and left at different frequencies and accelerations. And we noticed that when we do this for a while, bees inside the swarm tend to move around in the swarm and they collectively change the shape of the swarm to become a more uh, wide and also more stable uh, swarm as you see over here. Um, so how, how do the bees manage to coordinate this? Turns out it's all about the stretching of bonds that they make to their neighboring bees. And using a computational model, we, um, we show that um, those uh, bonds stretch more closer to the base of the swarm in comparison to the tip of the swarm, uh, and that bees could sense those um, uh, different stretchings to create a directional bias that directs them upward. But also, when they move upwards, this is a kind of mechanical altruism because bees move from areas where these bonds stretch less to areas where these bonds stretch more. So, and they do this for the uh, greater good of the entire swarm. Uh, what they also do is create materials that are autonomous and they embed sensing, computation, and actuation, which happens to be some of the long-standing aspirations in the field of swarm robotics. Uh, where the idea is to combine many, many uh, minimal and affordable robots that can work together, interact with each other, and create structures. Some famous examples of this include the kilobot that create two-dimensional structures and the uh, uh, M-blocks that create smaller but three-dimensional structures. So to end on a more philosophical note, what if we could combine all of this together and perhaps in the very far future we could um, apply the, those lessons that we learned from nature on perhaps construction materials for our buildings that can respond to it in the same ways that the honeybees do. Um, as Hero, uh, the young roboticist from the uh, movie Big Hero 6 says, the application to this tech could be limitless. Um, at the moment, of course, this is closer to science fiction, um, as um, depicted here in this beautiful rendering of a construction that is made of small little robots. 
Uh, but the more we know about natural solutions to this problem, uh, like the honeybee ones, that had the privilege of eons of evolutions to perfect these kind of structures, the closer we get to making that dream come true. Thank you so much. Yeah.